A warm welcome to all of you on this call and a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to the 2021 Driehaus Prize virtual ceremony. I am Stefanos Polizoides, Dean of the School of, Archi of Notre Dame School of Architecture and the chair of the jury for the Driehaus Prize. While I wish we were all gathered together in Chicago today, I'm pleased to be celebrating the careers and accomplishments of two extraordinary individuals, Sebastian Treze and the late John Reps. For the last 18 years, the awards have been jointly presented by the Dean of the School and the prize's patron, Richard Driehaus. Over the last few months and since his passing, we've all held the intense loss of, of Richard and never more so than today. I know that he was looking forward to honoring our 2021 laureates and I had talked to him on a number of occasions about it. We will move forward today with sadness, but knowing that Richard is still with us in spirit. The Driehaus Prize is, is more than a, than a weekend celebration. It has become a community of extraordinary practitioners, both architects and allied professionals, all dedicated to and creating and preserving the beauty of the human habitat and safeguarding its future, including buildings, public realm, gardens, cities, and the habitat's relationship to nature. This has especially been demonstrated over the last past year when we have not been able to gather in person, while at the same time collaboration and inspiration among our laureates, ju jury, students, faculty, admirers from around the world have continued unabated. It is now my, my great honor to introduce the newest member of this community, the, the 2021 laureate, Sebastian Treze. Sebastian is a leader in the process of the current architectural renewal in Germany, living up to the ideals espoused by the Driehaus Prize and making a pronounced cultural, environmental, and artistic impact both in his country and beyond. With his partners at Sebastian Treze Architecten, he has reinvigorated German, archi uh, German architecture but demonstrate, by demonstrating that it's possible to design imaginatively and still build within the context of one of the most distinguished cultural heritages in the world. The firm's buildings enrich the urban settings where they are constructed, and upon reflection, it is clear that they're imbued with a rich, rich understanding of both historical precedent and singular design projection. The jury, Corrected, correctly identified that the firm represents a new generation of European architects with the intellectual grounding and commitment to carefully re-examine the nature of building in the modern world, reinterpreting the lessons of the past to produce a new traditional architecture and urbanism that embodies the culture, climate, and physical order of existing places, and representing the values associated with open and just societies. Established in 2011, Sebastian Treze Architecten is based in Berlin with projects in Hamburg, Dusseldorf, and elsewhere in Germany, and with recent work as far afield as Mumbai, India. The Driehaus Prize and other major awards tend to look back on an architect's career, and while the jury certainly considered what has been designed and built so far by, by Treze Architecten, uh, an already impressive body of work. We're all excited to see what comes next for Sebastian and his partners. They have long careers ahead of them, and I believe their leadership will be transformative for Germany and beyond. The symbol of the Driehaus Prize is a horegic monument of Lysicrates in Athens, cast in bronze. This is where I would typically bestow the, the monument uh, to Treze Architecten, but FedEx 
had the honor of handing it over to them before I had a chance to. So please join me in congratulating Sebastian Trez and his partners in Sebastian Trez Architect and while they raise uh, their award. <laughs> Thank you very much to the jury and of course to Richard. We are very honored. This is really a peak of our career thus far. We would have loved to spend um, the evening, a um, few days with you in Chicago. Uh, let's hope we can do this in fall together. Thank you so much. Before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge Richard Rehaus and his contributions to our field. In particular, this award and the discourse it continues to inspire. He and his family are in our thoughts today as they have been for the past month. I am certain he is listening and I hope he is as pleased as we are today about this award, which we hope we have understood in his spirit as a mission. Dear Richard, dear Stephanos, dear Notre Dame School of Architecture, former laureates, clients and partners, friends and family. Of all the digital events we have grown accustomed to over the past year, this one is truly the most extraordinary and will probably be the most exciting one of our lives. It is the first award we've received for our work, our first public speech, and the first time we are in front of such a large audience. Of course, our preference would have been to be there with you today in Chicago. We are still as profoundly moved to be this year's laureates of the Richard Rios Prize as we were the first day we received the news and would have liked nothing more than to celebrate with everyone today. It also pains us that we cannot thank Richard personally for both this incredible award and his trust. We can only promise that we will interpret this recognition as a mandate to continue our work and to face every new task and challenge with courage and self-confidence. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Richard's wife, Ines, and the Driehaus Foundation. Moreover, the prize would be quite impossible without the effort of the jury who selected us from among many individuals with a broad and impressive range of work. We are honored and humbled to now join the ranks of architects to whom we looked up as fans just a few months ago and still do. One more group we'd like to thank in advance is the client we have had the privilege of working with. Architects are dependent on their client on the one who has the financial means to manifest our ideas of a better, different, or new world by funding their transformation and to build reality. To acknowledge this reality is to acknowledge the prize, that the prize also belongs to all those who have supported us. Most of our larger housing projects were developed with the family-run real estate developer Ralf Schmitz, who have been creating exceptional, exceptional buildings for well over a century. In Ralf Schmitz, we have found a partner with whom we share the same passion for building craftsmanship and sustainability. Our joy and passion for architecture and building is also shared by our great team. Without their dedication and uncompromising willingness to go the extra mile, it would be impossible to ensure the quality of our projects. Even the most modest building requires an inordinate, almost unreasonable effort to come to fruition. For those here today, it goes without saying that the creative process is sometimes a painful act. Once accomplished, however, it is hard to escape the almost intoxicating air of completed work. We founded our office 10 years ago and have grown continuously since. Our focus has been first and foremost on building with less attention paid to the intellectual and critical discourse. 
Instead, we chose to let our buildings speak for themselves. As a result, we have completed numerous residential projects, primarily, primarily in Germany's major cities, which, we, which were derived from the roots of the site without being tethered to the past. As the first German office and as a young laureates of this award, we would like to briefly explain how our practice has evolved and which figures were formative for us in guiding our creative work. Berlin after the fall of the wall is the history of a city that we as children during this time of upheaval were able to experience firsthand. Above all else, it was a li the lively and intense discourse about the new future for this newly reunited city that shaped us in our apprenticeship years. The almost magical appeal of the main protagonists at the time captivated us. For students, it was an educational paradise during those years because they were all here. Emerging from the theoretical debate before the fall of the wall, Oswald Matthias Ungers and his former students brought a breath of fresh air from Cornell to the divided and still war-torn city of Berlin. It was a chance to break free from the architectural depression of the post-war period. With a postmodern wind at their backs, they actively worked on the challenges of the time. And then, at precisely this moment, the wall was torn down and one of the greatest architectural and intellectual challenges arose how to turn a city that had been divided for 30 years into a new united entity. While respecting the roots of the past, the syntax of the city was reworked to form a new set of urban rules that draw on tradition, but behave in a contemporary fashion to anticipate the future. It is largely thanks to Josef Paul Kleihus as director of the International Building Exhibition in 1987 and later to Hans Stimmann as Berlin's building director that Berlin became what we love it for today. The idea of critical reconstruction, in essence, an architectural martial plan for the city, was an open liberal set of rules for the reconstruction of both the East and the West, and thus, for the urban reunification of Berlin. Unfortunately, the fierce discourse between the ideolo ideolo ideological camp can stifle the momentum and delight of the urban idea as manifested in the 1987 International Building Exhibition. Instead of continuing to explore our common rich and historical architectural vocabulary, adapting it morphologically to the times the debate became political. When one camp was labeled rationalist and the other modernist, architectural discourse in Berlin was virtually over. While a number of architects continued to produce great work, on the whole, architectural activity in Berlin became dominated by the production of anonymous and interchangeable grid facades or ostensibly ephemeral concrete and glass constructions. For us, it's primarily Hans Koloff's contribution to both, the architectural practice and the intellectual discourse that upon founding our office made it again possible to apply an architectural vocabulary which had until very recently been frowned upon. Hans has taught, written, and fiercely debated like no other about what matters most to him. An architecture of general validity, one that is supra-individual and of universal consensus, and that the responsibility for creating this lies in the hands of the architect. The fire he kindled in our hearts back then still burns today. In 2011, when we founded our practice, a fog had settled over the battlefield of ideological wars and reconstruction debates. We simply began to do what for us seemed sensible, appropriate, and beautiful. With a playful ease, we applied the almost infinite spectrum of architectural vocabulary. We talked about colonnades, tried out arches, 
through window mountains, topped off houses with large roofs, and structured the facades of our designs tectonically. In the process, we made use of images from our personal experience, the results of our on-site research, and learned to rely on our artistic and sculptural eye. In the end, it's about creating an individual sense of identity for our place, a long-lasting and sustainable contribution that mirrors an ideal open and welcoming society. We consider our buildings to be good only when they serve the visual habits inherent to us all. For us, building is not only about the architectural and urban vocabulary, but also about proven construction principle and craftsmanship techniques. In terms of sustainability, we are committed to building as durably as possible with regional materials and in cooperation with qualified comp companies. These principles and techniques are an important cultural asset that, if not promoted and regularly implemented, are in danger of dying out. The fact that quality has to be renegotiated for each project and client is not a burden for us, but rather an incentive. We consciously strive to promote the ideal of sustainable architecture based on tradition, yet conducive of contemporary life. After all, architecture is about humanity, awareness of the spatial environment and its direct impact on the everyday. A building is not a one-off product. It requires the willingness to invest value, to create quality, to achieve strength, utility, and beauty. In our view, this is the only way to create buildings in this day and age whose intrinsic value can equal that of our architectural heritage. If the last 10 years were dedicated purely to design work and the brutal practice of construction, with the Driehaus Prize, we have reached a turning point in our work, an opportunity, if not a mandate, to stand by our actions with words. What moves us and furious us is not ideological modernism, which is so often painted as our adversary, but the total absence of architecture in our cities and suburbs, which is a danger of de degenerating into nothing more than square footage. Under the guise of economy and thrift, our cities are littered with irrelevant boxes glued together with high-tech adhesive and styrofoam skins to protect against the climate. Both social housing and supposedly luxurious apartments for the new bourgeoisie have suffered the same fate. We want to take advantage of our time today to underscore that it is worthwhile to work on every construction task with care, to, evalu to evaluate its basics principle and to stand up for them unconditionally. So far, the architecture of the ordinary and every day has occupied our professional lives. And when it becomes a complementary part of the whole, it fills us with joy. Now we want to transfer this skill to the next task, above all to the urban planning issues of our time. Urbanism is architecture something we also learned in post-reunification Berlin. If in the future we manage to keep the discourse about the city free of ideologies, we will have already achieved a lot. The last year may have played into our hands here. In no time have our homes been so strained as in the recent periods of total isolation due to the restrictive measures taken to fight the spread of the virus. Will this experience lead to a fundamental change in the architecture of the home and thus the architecture of the cities? No. On the contrary, we find that the carefully planned houses and the precisely formulated public space of the early 20th century European city withstood these strains. Despite isolation, cities gave us a sense of community and solidarity. 
This image of the city is now experiencing a renaissance and will influence the debate that is beginning about the city after Corona. We are convinced that we have arrived at a time when we can once again offer the achievements and benefits of traditional building to a broad open society. If this society once again consciously chooses beautiful and good houses, regardless of the users, the city will gain immense appeal as a living space and put a stop to the urban sprawl decimating our natural landscapes. Living in the confined space of a commun community can work, both in a practical and in a cultural sense. The evidence is right in front of us. In our cities, in cities we have, which have for over 100 years been tested by millions of study participants. So let's look for the everyday beautiful and get back to doing what architects and builders have been doing for centuries to building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, very much for your remarks and for your work and that of your partners. Uh, we are very much looking forward uh, to the future of your firm and to the work that is, that is coming. Uh, we now turn our attention to honoring the winner of the 2021 Henry Hope Reed Award, John Reps, a renowned historian of urbanism whose work has deeply influenced generations of architects and urbanists. Until his death in November 2020, John Reps was professor emeritus at the College of Architecture, Art and Planning at Cornell University, where he had served on the faculty since 1951. I'll quote now extensively from, from uh, uh, Richard Driehaus. Many people espouse the virtue of learning from our past, but John Reps was a rare individual who undertook the serious research to unearth buried treasure in the form of orig original materials related to exactly what made the design of this admired cities and towns so very successful. Furthermore, Reps not only ensured this information was published, but he personally taught so many aspiring urban planners, designers, and architects that he established an enduring academic legacy. The, the jury also stated, the work of Reps is also integral to the understanding and practice of architecture and urbanism today. The results of his extraordinary scholarship and urbanist advocacy have inspired two generations of designers and are quietly embedded in their buildings and places throughout the United States and around the world. Perhaps his best known iconic book, The Making of Urban America of 1965. Uh, he, has, he was a prolific author of more than a dozen others on the history of American urbanism, as well as the owner and publisher of Historic Urban Plans, a company producing and disseminating the most influential example of city plans ever made, both in our country and abroad. I can vouch from personal experience on the importance of the making of urban America to my own work. It was the first book that I ever bought as a young college sophomore in 1966, with the thought of assembling a library that would be useful to my future endeavors. A number of, a number of other members of the, jury, of the jury mentioned similar stories about how this book enriched their understanding of both the depth and the promise of a new American urbanism during this and especially difficult time for architectural education. At a time when the study of such materials were ac actively discouraged in academia, Reps's commercial venture was also an active form of defying the narrow teaching and professional norms then in effect. In recognition of his status as the father of modern American city planning history, in 1996, the American Planning Association designated him a planning pioneer. Unfortunately, John Reps passed away right around the time of the jury's decision. Today, 
We have his children here to accept the award on his behalf. Please join me in, welcome, in welcoming them here today, Thomas and Marty Reps. Hi. <clears throat> I'd like to start by expressing my condolences to the Driehaus family. Uh, my father, if he were still alive, would have loved to have met him in person. And I know that they would have had a wide-ranging wide discussion uh, of the history of city planning in Chicago. Having lost my own father a few months before, I deeply sympathize with your loss. About a month after my father passed away, I received an email message out of the blue which said, Please call me about an academic honor that your father has received posthumously. I have to admit that my first thought was, are computer criminals getting so clever that they are now specially targeting the families of recently departed academics? A little Googling suggested that it was something that was on the up and up, and when I called Dean Alazardi's back, he didn't ask for my credit card number, which was a good sign. I recently heard a quote that was uh, ascribed to Kurt Vonnegut that we are born into a biological family but spend our life <clears throat> trying to find the other family in which we belong. My sister and I grew up in a house whose walls were filled with old maps. As a 10-year-old, I accompanied my father to an antiquarian bookstore in London where he purchased a copy of the 24-sheet 1746 genre of map of London. And I was sworn to secrecy to never reveal to my mother that he had spent $325 on it, a relatively large sum, in 1966. So when I saw the framed sections of the 12 sheet 1748 Noli map of Rome in the background of Dean Polozoides during his Zoom eulogy for Richard Driehaus, it was clear that this community was the other family that my father was part of. My father would have been very pleased by this recognition, and I thank him on his behalf. My father almost made it to 99 and was probably multiple academic and biological generations older than anyone at this ceremony. So possibly most of you met him. If that is the case and you're interested to know what it's like to converse with him, I encourage you to read a remembrance of my father that a former Cornell student in James McMillan published in the February 2021 issue of the Journal of Planning History. I sent it to one of my friends, and as he put it, Macmillan has a great ear and captures your dad's voice to a T. Each quote was like having him in the room. Finally, I wanted to let you know that my sister and I have donated the prize money to the Society for American City and Regional Planning History to endow their John Reps dissertation awards for masters and PhD dissertations, which they've awarded every odd numbered year since 1993, and also to endow a new program of John Reps travel awards for graduate students to attend the Society's biennial conferences. So thank you once again on behalf of my father for recognizing his work with this award. I know that he has been honored. Thank you, Tom and Marty, for bringing to life the work of your father. And thank you all for being here with us today to celebrate the amazing accomplishments of both Sebastian Treze and John Reps. Congratulations to Sebastian and his partners, as well to the Reps family. The world is a, is a brighter place today for the work of our new laureates. I would like to thank the members of the jury for having identified them and presented them to us today. Robert Davis, Melissa Del Vecchio, Leon Creer, Michael Ikudis, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, Dimitri Porfirius, and, and uh, Witold Rybczynski for their service in this most unusual we year. We very much thank them. I hope to see them as well as everyone else in the audience back in person for the 22 Driehaus Prize ceremonies. I would also like to express my appreciation for our friend and patron, Richard H. Driehaus, as well as to the leaders of the Driehaus Charitable Trust. 
We greatly miss Richard's enthusiastic presence during today's ceremony. His vision to partner with Notre Dame on this prize is the reason we're gathered here today. It is the reason for the creation of this amazing community of laureates assembled over the last 19 years. I commit myself as, and I commit the work and energy of the jury to continuing to, this, to, to serve this endeavor in Richard's bright memory. Best wishes to you all for participating in, in this call today. I look forward to better days ahead when we'll be together and in person. Please join me in one last acknowledgement of Sebastian Treze and John Reps at 2021 Driehaus and Henry Hope Reed Laureates. Have a very good day, everyone, and goodbye.